You look beautiful. You haven't even looked at me. How do you? Know? I am looking. I I can't take my eyes off you. You you have great looking hair. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ken, it's good to uh, good to see you again. I've been wanting to do this show for a long time on okay. Burundi. Burundi is one of those coffees that, you know, a, a lot of people still have not heard of it. In observing people in places where you can buy beans, I find that people are sometimes less likely to try something if they're just not familiar with the name or they don't picture it. And Burundi is, I think, still one of those coffees. You know, they know Kenya, they know Rwanda, but they may not know Burundi, and it's from the same basic region. Uh, most people don't know where Burundi is. I'm not sure I did until I started drinking the coffee. It's uh, <laughs> in Central Africa, what's called the African Great Lakes region, where there's enormous lakes at the head of the Nile River. And Burundi is this little country right here. It's probably about the size of Delaware, and uh, right above it is Rwanda, another great coffee yeah. growing region. Here's Tanzania, yes. there's Kenya up here, Ethiopia farther up, and the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo grows coffee right along here. But we're going to be talking about Burundi today. Is there a way you would describe the taste profiles of the, of the different countries? If you look at it, the, the African Great Lakes region where the head of the Nile, it's all these huge lakes. That region has a fairly distinctive and coherent cup profile in the traditional, the traditional cup profile, before the, the producers start messing around with different processing methods. Those countries are Rwanda, as you said, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo used to be Zadi. Uh, they have a growing region for Arabica right next to the Great Lakes across uh, the lake from uh, Rwanda. Uganda, Uganda is a little corner of Uganda as part of that. That's pretty coherent and that's one style. If you move towards the Indian Ocean from there, you get to a different mountain range and that's the range where that Kenya, the central Kenya great coffees, and also Tanzania, the northern Tanzania coffees. Along. If uh, you're looking for a landmark and a map, it'd be Mount Kilimanjaro, which is close to the border with Kenya, but in Tanzania. That's a different style, somewhat different style of coffee. Now, is it just the the terroir itself that varies, that gives it, or is there a... No, no. What are all the factors? The characteristics of the Central African coffees, including Burundi, are very high elevations and varieties that are related to Bourbon. As some viewers will know, Bourbon and Tipica are the two great branches of coffee that were disseminated around the world. I mean, Ethiopia has its own coffees, Yemen has sown coffees. Around the world, the main streams are Bourbon and Tipica, Tipica being the first of uh, Bourbon uh, coming from the island of Reunion. Bourbon was taken to Latin America, I think, fairly early in the history of coffee, probably the early 19th century. But it wasn't taken to Africa until fairly late. When it was taken to Africa, there were no other varieties there growing. In other words, the African coffee industry started with Bourbon, unlike Latin America, which started with Tipica and had, has uh, developed a whole bunch of different varieties that I think have diluted in some way that I don't understand, diluted Bourbon. So the Bourbon is not as distinctive usually when it's grown in Latin America. But in Africa, where it's been dominant for years, it's developed a certain kind of character. Oh, I forgot to talk about <laughs> processing method. <laughs> the processing method is washed processing, where the, fr the fruit residue is removed from the parchment coffee before it's dried. They tend to do a complex two-stage processing method. 
after the beans, the, the skins are removed from the beans or they're pulped, there's a dry ferment, meaning that it's a kind of a soupy, no added water, bean soup, thick bean soup sort of uh, thing. And, and there's a period, maybe 12 hours or 24, depends on where it is, at, that the dry process is carried, a dry ferment not dry process, dry ferment process is carried out. Then there's usually water added to the tanks. Then the coffee is washed. So the, the uh, pulp, the loosened pulp that's been loosened by the ferment is washed off. But then they put it in another tank in clean water and they soak it again. Some people call it a second ferment. Technically, I don't think it's a ferment because there's no material left to ferment, really. It creates a very clean, final clean taste because the last of the material, the pulpy stuff, the fruit flesh, the mucilage has been removed. So that's characteristic. It's often called the double washed method, uh, so on. That method plus the, the Bourbon varieties, which are many, but they're all related to Bourbon. Those are the two, and the high elevations. <laughs> it's interesting. I admit that not the coffees I'm most familiar with, when I taste them, the instant impression I got is you said they were overall clean. We'll get into this when we go through and taste, but I could tell you the brightness and the big flavor you know, footprint overall is really awesome in, in these coffees. That's a general characteristic that I would say jumps out. Right. I think that the acidity is usually contexted in the bean. It doesn't, it's like uh, notes played on a cello instead of a violin maybe. But I think that's true. I mean, this is the characteristic or legacy cup of Central Africa that we're talking about. I should say too that in Kenya they have, they grow different varieties. They're, they're variations on Bourbon, but they're unique to Kenya. Now they've hauled one of them, SL28, out all, all over the world now. Those varieties are not the same as the Central African varieties. They had the same genesis from Bourbon, but they're There's different. something different. Yeah. So in an unusual moment it has been reached here, I'm finished talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll save this episode for a sweeps week. <laughs> right. I think at some point, uh, we need to talk a little bit about the structure of the industry, of the coffee growing industry in, uh, in Central Africa, and particularly Burundi. It's uh, small producers. They produce very little coffee. Maybe uh, finished coffee, maybe one bag of 120 pounds, a typical coffee bag, or 150 per, per farmer. Wow. And apparently there are about 800,000 farmers in the little country of Burundi. The farmers take their coffee cherry, the coffee fruit, to places called washing stations. This is typical of Africa. And the washing stations may be owned by exporters. Some of them are part of very idealistic development mm -hmm. uh, projects. Mm -hmm. The cherry is then processed by the owners or the directors of these washing stations. That's the key moment. The, the choices that are made by the uh, directors or managers of the washing stations. Right now, in Burundi, as in all over the coffee world, these managers are experimenting with other uh, processing methods, other than the classic uh, Central Africa washed method that I described, the double wash. And maybe at this point I should say that the challenge for me today will be to try to identify the processing method. Is the processing method a traditional double washed Burundi process or is it a natural process where the coffee's dried in the cherries or is it a honey process? Burundi people have not been very adventurous, so I don't think we'll have any uh, anaerobic or fancy mm -hmm. processes, but we might. When you brought up bringing it to the washing station, it occurred to me one of the coffees we're going to have today, the owner of, of the roastery, uh, she told me she grew up in the coffee business. Her father was a grower, and she recalls walking 30 miles with the green coffee on her head 
with other people who work in their f family farm. And they would walk 30 miles to take it to a washing station. And sometimes it would, they would have to wait at the washing station two days for the coffee to get taken there. But they would walk there. She indicated to me she walked there in one day. I have to admit, I, I don't know how long it takes to walk 30 miles. And then they wouldn't receive their payment for three months. But she said they would have a great celebration when they received the payment. Was that in Burundi? Yeah, in or? Burundi. Yeah. Great. So yeah. We'll, we'll get a chance to try. I don't think it's her coffee that she roasts currently, but her family still grows coffee there. That was fascinating uh, talking with her. I'll tell you what, I'm ready to have some coffee. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more shows like this.